Good to see everybody here this morning. There's an excitement in the house. We like that. We like that. Uh, we want to welcome everyone to Ridgecrest Baptist Church. Um, and uh, if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you to Ridgecrest Baptist Church. And uh, we ask that you give us a record of your attendance today. If you notice in our bulletin there, we have a little tear-off section. So if you will go ahead and fill in all that information there or, or information you'd like for us to have, uh, we'd love to uh, contact you. And it'll probably be by mail, by phone, or email, or whatever it says there. And uh, we may even come by to see you. We'd love to do that if you let us do that. So if you will put that in there, and when the offering comes around, if you will uh, put that in the offering, uh, that would be wonderful. But it is good to see everyone here today. You know, it's an exciting Sunday, uh, especially exciting because it's, uh, it's a day that... Uh, we get a chance to uh, uh, actually see the fruits of the labors of our pastor search team. And last week, I know that we got a chance to give them a, a round of applause, but I want to do that again. I'm not going to make them stand or do anything like that, but I want to say, pastor search team, we appreciate you. Amen. <laughs> Brother Ronald, I think, did that last week. Uh, but we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all the hard work you've put in. And... Uh, if you're looking at your bulletin, it says immediately following this morning's worship service, uh, something that you well know, our pastor search team will have a special call and business meeting uh, to vote, uh, call for a vote on our prospective pastor, and uh, that is Brother Scott Thompson. And uh, yesterday, actually on Friday, the staff had a chance to meet with Brother Scott and his family and uh, had a wonderful time. And then yesterday, the church family had a chance to get together and meet with Brother Scott was introduced to Brother Scott, and uh, and uh, so you, you you know a, a little bit more. They everybody's. I told Brother Scott this. Everybody's been kind of out in the dark about a lot of things, but now they know it all. They just know everything about you, Brother Scott. And uh, so we welcome. Not everything. <laughs> yeah, some things only Mama knows, right? Yeah, but we welcome you here today, and we're looking forward to uh, your message in in uh, just a few moments. And know God's going to bless and and continue to pray. Uh, that God's will would be done today. Uh, if you look at your uh, opportunities for service, you can see the ones for this week and also the ones uh, for next Sunday. The, the one I would point out would be the leadership team meeting today at 4 o'clock, and that's an important meeting, so leadership team, uh, don't, don't forget that. And, uh, and uh, even if you're visiting, stay around with us. And, and Yes, ma'am. Okay, the widower's meal. Okay, widow and widower's meal. It's easy to say, isn't it? Uh, will be Sunday. I uh, will be Wednesday at 11 o'clock, uh, back in the fellowship hall. Uh, any other announcements? Maybe some that I have missed. Good to have you. Yes. Okay, so we got uh, children's choirs working on their children's musicals. So, if you've got a child, a grandchild, or just some child in the neighborhood, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Just bring them on. Okay. Uh, talk to mom and dad before you do that, please. But uh, just invite them to come, and let's, let's have a full children's choir. And uh, we'll burn some more CDs if you need, need to on the demo because they're joining left and right, and it's going to be wonderful. So at this point in time, we're going to sing our welcome song. And uh, I want you to shake hands, hug necks, and greet each other in the name of the Lord as our children are dismissed for Children's Church. So let's stand.
praise today. How's the Lord? Amen. You may be seated. In baptism and so now God has convicted her of that and she wants to follow through in obedience to him and um, Maggie's going to be going on a mission trip soon to Thailand and one of the requirements is, is of course that she be saved and be baptized so we're going to take care of that for her today so what a joy it is that I present to you Miss Maggie Gregory Hang on. now uh, Maggie and I, we have talked, and, and uh, I firmly believe that she knows Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so today, she stands here before you to be baptized. And so, Maggie, I have two questions for you. Uh, number one, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior because of his death and resurrection at the cross? Yes, sir. Out here, Maggie, is your friends and your family, is there anything that you would like to say? Uh, thank you, and just please continue to pray for my team and I as we're about to leave to go on a mission trip. Amen. And so, Maggie, in accordance with the ordinance of the church, that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Maggie and I have talked, and we, and we wanted to make sure that she understood that baptism is not the thing that saves her, but it's her, uh, her outward show of her dedication to Jesus and what Jesus has done in her life. We know that salvation comes through Jesus alone, according to John 14, 6. And so what a joy it is for me today to help her to follow in obedience uh, in baptism. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that salvation only comes through you and not by anything that we can do, not by our own merits or talents, but because of your sacrifice on the cross by your resurrection from the grave. And so, Lord, we thank you for that hope. I thank you so much for Maggie as she prepares to uh, get ready to go to Thailand during her Christmas break. May you be with her, her family, and the entire team as they go and be Jesus across the world. So, Lord, we just give this service up to you. Lord, have your will and your way for these things I ask. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let the song be. 
I'm telling you, if that don't light your fire, your wood's wet, right? <laughs> Let the sounds of hallelujah. It's an invitation to worship the Lord and however he leads you today. Amen. We're going to sing a song now. Uh, and you can stand if you want to because uh, sometimes when you're singing some of these uh, songs are a little bit peppier. Uh, you, you know, you just got to stand and sing. So stand and sing with us. Blessed be your name. Somewhere between rehearsal and now, my bass is going crazy out of tune here. <laughs> Miss Vicky, I need a G. Okay. Give me a D. A. Okay, an E. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate you. 
Yeah. yeah. All right. That was a new song we just wrote, okay? We're going we're gonna to put lyrics to it this week. Okay. Okay. We'll call it Tuning Up for Jesus. How's that? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, here's a song. You know, we, we think about Thanksgiving. We've got a lot of things to be thankful for during, our, during this past Thursday. We thought about all of God's gifts, all the things he's given to us, and how blessed we are. But the most important thing is that he lives, amen? amen. And it's because he lives that we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, amen. Amen. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, what a privilege and an honor to be able to come into your house today, Lord, to worship and to, <clears throat> to praise you, Lord. Lord, I just ask you, first of all, Lord, forgive me where I fail you, Lord. Lord, so many times I just feel so undesirable, Lord, that, but by the blood of Jesus, Lord, thankfully you see me as a new creature, Lord. Amen. And Lord, I just thank you as we come today, Lord, to take up these tithes and offerings. Lord, that we do so in obedience to your word and with joy to give back to you the time, the talents, and the money that you give us, Lord. Lord, we just praise you and just pray that you are continually glorified through us and this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Everybody sing along with us. There is a river of gladness that pours from Emmanuel's veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved. Did that happen to you? I sure hope so. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past a broken at last, I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. I'm good. I want more. That's why I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How good I want more. I'm Jesus, so how could we want more? Amen. I think I mentioned this one time before, the good work, the great work, the hard work that the pastor search team did, I think came together the night we had a meeting, and we came over here and prayed at the altar, and we asked God to take us out of it, and, he do it, and him to do the work, and that work is fulfilled today. I want to introduce Brother Scott to you, but first of all, I want the family to, ray, uh, to stand up. Let me introduce them. This is his wife, Miss Renee, Joshua, his son, and his daughter, Caroline. Y'all make them feel welcome, and I know you already have. And the one we have tried to keep a secret for so long and so hard. Some of you have not met him, but you're in for a treat this morning. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to introduce to you our prospective pastor, Brother Scott Thompson. Never 
around you. I look forward to seeing God do some incredible, awesome things, things that we can only say that God did that. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you came this morning. Go ahead, look at them. I'm glad you came this morning. Glad you came this morning. In 2005, my high school graduating class had its 20-year reunion. Yes, young people, I was in high school at one time, and all the wise people said. The organizers of the reunion requested that each graduate send personal information via the Internet. I submitted my information, but I did not go to the reunion. My best memory from high school was my sophomore year in 1983, when the Holy Spirit of God convicted me of my sin and regenerated me into a new person. My life verse is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. But in a school, especially in a public school, a biblical Christian is not the most popular person. In fact, in a, in, a, in a school where a person is trying to live for Jesus, trying to be a follower of Jesus Christ, they are not usually invited to be part of the popular crowd. He or she is usually isolated and is usually the object of jokes and ridicule and is usually does not have many or in fact have a few friends. Young people, you listen to me. You listen to me. Every time somebody makes fun of you about Jesus, every time somebody says something to you about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is a blessing from God. Amen. That is a blessing from the Lord. It is a blessing from Him. And not only are we going to preach to the young people, we're going to preach to the younger people, those that are 80, 94 and below. Can anybody say amen? It doesn't matter if you're on the road or where you go. It doesn't matter if you're at the gas station, on vacation, or at your place of employment. We need to understand that suffering for Jesus Christ is a blessing of Him. Because God will allow people in your life, He will allow people in your time on this earth who see your relationship with Jesus Christ as a joke, as a crutch, as something to view with disdain and derision. I had plenty of people in Southwood High School in Shreveport, Louisiana, who laughed at me for living for Jesus. One such person, and I have his permission to use his testimony, was Bubba Winningham. He and I were in, the, in physical education together our junior year. We were in English in our senior year. I would try to talk to him about Jesus and about salvation, about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. About that time in your life when you come to the cross and you repent of your sin and you believe in the power that God that raised Jesus from the dead. But every gospel witness that was encountered was with, encountered with a joke or him laughing at me about my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. My desire was to live for the Lord. My desire was to no longer be spiritually blind. And Bubba's problem is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, where it says, To those that are not believing, their eyes have been blinded by the God of this age. Now, I don't know what your, what your theology tells you, and I don't know what, your, what, what you think about it, but folks, the devil is real. He is a real being. He is a real angel fallen from God's grace that tried to take over heaven. And let me... Let me give you a little secret. Anytime you try to take on God, He will kick your tail every time. Can anybody say amen? I wanted Bubba to understand that he could have a new heart, that he could have a new life. Bubba never accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Do you know someone who's spiritually blind? Do you know someone that needs to know about the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you spiritually blind? Has there been a time in your life that... You've come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you've repented of your sin and believed on Him as your Savior. Because if you haven't, you need to understand very clearly, a physically blind man can see more than you can if he is saved by God's grace and you are not. Without Jesus Christ, the Word of God says you are spiritually blind. You are dead in your sins. You are walking around in darkness, blind and begging. And folks, I will not apologize to anybody. I will go into the cage with anybody. Jesus Christ is the only way a person can be saved. 
He's not a good way to heaven. He's not a great way to heaven. He's not even the best way to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Why? Because he said he is. And if this says it, I believe it. You finish it for me. That settles it. Can anybody say amen? amen. In Ezra, in the, the prophet Ezra, in Nehemiah verse 8, in chapter 8 verse 5, the temple had been reinstated by Nehemiah. And the word of God says, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Folks, we need to get in the habit of our churches of not being asked to, be, to stand when the word of God is read. We need to do it automatically because we love the Bible so much. Amen? Take your Bible, please, and turn to Luke chapter 18. What book? Somebody tell me. What book? What chapter? Verse 18, and you're listening, God. Verse what? 35. If you're physically able, hold your Bible up and repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. And where my life does not line up in thoughts, attitudes, and actions, I will change. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I believe the Bible. Go ahead and tell them. I believe the Bible. As Brother Kenneth preached last week on the ten lepers, one coming back to thank God in Luke 17, I'm going to continue here in Luke chapter 18. My commitment is to preach through books of the Bible verse by verse and unleash the truth verse by verse. Verse 35, Luke records, And it came about that he was, that's Jesus, approaching Jericho. A certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire what this might be. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Son of David, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Somebody say that with me. And Jesus stopped. Jesus has time for anybody and everybody who has time for him. Amen. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he brought, be brought to him. And when he had come near, he questioned him. What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Pray with me if you would, please. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your great love for us. Father, I pray in the church you would give us once again, God, a burden for those that are lost and need to hear about Jesus. God, I pray for the lost person that's here today. That, God, they would hear the truth of the gospel. That, God, they would realize that there is a heaven to be gained, that there is a, be there is a hell to be shunned. And I pray, Lord God, that you would hide me behind the cross and the people would see the Lord Jesus Christ. God, may today the Son of God be glorified. God, may the saint be edified. May the sinner be evangelized. And Lord, may the devil be terrified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. As you're seated, look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're coming back next week. I'm glad you're coming by next week. Glad you're coming back. I want you to see two things in this passage of Scripture. Two things in this passage of Scripture. The blind now see because of a plea. Say that with me. The blind now see because of a plea. You can do a little better than that one more time. The blind now see because of a plea. Now I want you to see something. I want you to hear something. I want you to feel something here in verses 35 through 39. The first thing I want you to do is to see the desperation of the blind man. See the desperation of the blind man. Luke says in verse 35, And it came about that as he, Jesus, was approaching Jericho, a certain blind man was sitting by the road begging. And so Jesus is approaching Jericho. Now you need to understand something from Matthew and Mark. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all called the synoptic gospels. That means they write in, in tandem that, that everything fits together. Now, Roman Jericho lies to the south of Old Testament Jericho. 
So Matthew and Mark state that Jesus is departing Jericho, but Luke says he is approaching Jericho. Basically what he's doing, he is leaving the old part of Jericho and he is approaching the part that Rome has built in their domination over Israel. When I say get it, you say got it. Get it? Got it. Okay. So Jericho is a jewel of a city sitting there as an oasis in the Judean desert. Known as the city of palms, Jericho is an oasis of fresh water, beautiful trees, productive crops of figs, citra, etc., etc., etc. And so there's a blind man who's sitting on the road. He's probably on a crossroads there because blind people were common in the ancient Near East. They could not secure jobs. They could not be gainfully employed. In fact, in Jesus' day, few families would even support someone who was blind. And so the majority of blind people, and we know that this is commonly known as the man Bartimaeus, they're beggars. They sit by the byways, they sit by the commerce crossroads, hoping that some money-earning travelers would give them charity. He's lost. And we need to see the desperation of this blind man. He cannot make a living. He's not invited into social circles. He's an outcast, basically, and he has lost his sight. I can remember the Sunday school director of the church that I went to as a young person. I was in the 10th grade. We had moved up into the 10th grade, and my dad had had gotten right with the Lord. We had been out of church a long time. We hadn't gone to church in a long time, and my dad got right with, with the Lord, went by and talked to the pastor and talked to some people in the church. Dad got right with God. It's always good when Daddy gets right with God. Amen? And I remember that Sunday school director asking me, Scott, in two weeks I want you to give your personal testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. I said, okay. Uh, I've been through the baptism waters two times. I've been there twice. And the more I thought about that, and the more I debated that, and the more I complicated, thought about that, even as a, as a 15-year-old uh, young man, I thought, you know what? I don't even have a testimony. I don't even know what a testimony is. I thought you just went to church, you you said a few words in a prayer, you got dunked in a baptismal tank, and everything was all right. I didn't have any testimony about how Jesus had changed my life, about how, how the Lord had changed me from the inside out. I didn't even know what it was. I was thinking to myself, I'm not saved. And if I die, I'm going to hell. I'm lost without Jesus. Let me remind you something, folks. Hell is real. Not because some scholar one day got in a think tank and said hell is not real anymore or hell never existed. I don't care how many PhDs he's got on his wall. Jesus talked about hell twice as much as he talked about heaven. And real people go to hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. Right or wrong on a Sunday morning. That's exactly right. And I'm like this blind man in Jericho. I was hopeless. I was engulfed in spiritual darkness because of my own sin, my own rebellion against God. I'd heard the gospel many times. I'd even been baptized twice. But on that day, I knew that I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ like my new youth minister, Brother Scott. Where is Scott? So now that's that's a trio of Scott. Y'all are going to get tired of Scott's around here. So they started beginning to tell me that knowing Jesus was more than just having religion. It was more than just going to church. It was more than just showing up and and going through the motions. It was a personal relationship with the God of the universe. And folks, I was lost, and I would submit to you today that the church needs to gain, in our Southern Baptist Convention, our churches need to gain or regain a clear view of lost people. church to share the gospel it's our job that's our job description win the lost make disciples that's it amen win disciple do it again right amen that's what we're supposed to be doing we need to regain a vision for those who are lost we need to understand that we are going to give account to god one day for how we lived our lives and the gospel testimony that we shared with other people folks heaven and hell is not a joke 
And I, I'll be your best friend. I, I'll be as nice as I can be. I can counsel you until I don't know how to counsel you anymore. I, and I like to laugh and I like to have fun. But let me tell you something. In this pulpit, all cards are on the table. Amen? Preaching is a full contact sport. Can anybody say amen? amen. The word of God is clear. We are to gain a vision. We are to regain a vision of those who are lost. Man, didn't that bless you when that young, what's her name, it got baptized? Did that bless you? I know it did. You all clapped. What if it was one? What if it was five? What if it was ten? What if it was twenty? What if it was twenty-five? You'll say, Brother Scott, that can never happen. Listen, you need to get a new vision of the God you serve if you don't think he can do anything from where a church, where the word of God is preached, where the people love each other, and where they love people who are on the outside that need to come on the inside, right or wrong, on a Sunday morning. Amen? Do you have a biblical testimony of faith in Christ? Are you saved today? Man, didn't that choir and that praise team do a good job today? Didn't they do an awesome job today? Go ahead, give them another hand. Amen. It'll help them out. Believe me. Do you know Jesus? If not, today is the day to call out to him, to ask him for salvation, for forgiveness of sins. I call you to come out of darkness into the glorious light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Leave the life of sin behind. Leave the gutter behind. Come to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and he will save you and keep you for all eternity. And all the church said? Amen. So we see the desperation in this plea from this beggar. And then we hear the request of the blind man. We hear that request. And what is it in verses 36 and 37? Now hearing a multitude going by, he began to inquire what this might be. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. A multitude is passing by. Who are they? Where are they going? Well, they're headed to the Jewish festival of Passover. They are seeking God's forgiveness. And the beggar wants to know what is happening. They're headed up to Jerusalem. Why is there such a large crowd? Jesus is in the crowd. He is passing through. And any time Jesus was around, any time he was walking and teaching, there were large crowds that followed him because they wanted to gain a sight, a gain a look, get a, get a glimpse of the famous preacher, the miracle worker from Galilee. And the beggar gets an answer. Jesus is coming through Jericho. The Messiah of Israel is coming to town. What will he do? Will he preach? Will he perform a miracle? What will he do? Man, that ought to be the way church is, Amen. What's going to happen this Sunday morning? Who's going to get saved this Sunday morning? Y'all been praying for revival? You've been praying for um, the things of God for revival here? What, what, what expectation do you have when you come to God's house? Have I got a problem with the microphone here? Okay, can somebody come help me? No. All right. All God's people say it. Hello? Hello? Okay, back to Luke chapter 18, verse 35. I'm sure somebody back there said he doesn't even need a microphone anyway. <laughs> I don't know if y'all knew who Keith Green was. He was a great preacher, gospel singer. My youth minister asked me, he said, Hey, Scott, you, you want to go to a concert? I was like, Yeah. Man, I want to go to a concert. Man, the concerts I was used to were loud. Your ears bled for three days. Pyrotechnics went off all over the place. Smoke. I mean, it, it was you know it was awesome. That that that's that was my idea of a concert. So we get there to the Shreveport Memorial Auditorium. They move a curtain back, and there's a screen up there. It's like, man, where, where are the drums? Where's the guitar? Where where what, what is this? Y'all said this was a concert, and this lady came up, Miss Green came up, and she began to share some things about how Keith Green had died in a, in, a, in a plane crash there in East Texas. And then they flipped a switch, and there's a video of a guy playing a piano. I'm thinking, man, this is not what I want to see. Would you agree with that, young people? I mean, I'm not really interested in nothing against piano players, but you just got to understand. I'm 15. I like high-energy music. And all the high-energy music people said, amen. amen, okay? But man, the more Keith Green sang and the more he played, the more he talked about Jesus, you know what I said to myself? He's got something I don't have. 
He's talking about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about a relationship, as Martin Luther said, in this 500th year of our Reformation, of the Reformation. I want a God who loves me and a God that I can love. And I begin to sit there and as, as I listen to that man talk and as I listen to him on that video, I said, something's wrong with me. There's an emptiness in my heart. I didn't know how to define it. I didn't know anything about soteriology or eschatology. I didn't, I didn't know anything about anthropology. I didn't know anything about anything. All I knew is when I got in trouble, I was apologizing to my mom and daddy so I didn't get my hottie tore up. Can anybody say amen? I didn't know anything about that. And then a guy came out after the, after the, the video was over. A guy came out and he just preached a simple gospel message. And as I said yesterday, I'll say it again. At the end of the day, all we have is the gospel. Amen. That's all we have. And that man began to say, God loves every person. And every person can be saved. If you got a question about that for me, I believe, I, I am what's called a traditionalist. I believe God can save anybody. He will save anybody who will call on his name. Jesus died for the sins of the world. And those who call on him, he saves them right that very nanosecond. Amen? Does that clear it up for some of you? Amen? And that man got up and preached and said, anybody can be saved. Jesus rose from the dead. You just have to repent of your sin, confess him as Lord and Savior, and he will save you. And then he asked the question of the crowd. If you know you're going to heaven, stand up. And folks, I could not stand up. People were standing up all around me. And at that point in my life, I was under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I was under the conviction of a holy God that I was separated from Him and I had sinned against Him, but He still loved me. He still wanted me to be saved. I couldn't stand up that night. And I remember it was a cold December night. In 1982, December of 1982, we got on that Bluebird bus. Anybody ever got on a Bluebird bus and did something for the church? It was cold. And I remember looking out that window, that frosty window, saying to myself, I've got to get right with God. I need to get saved. I was under conviction. I knew I was going to hell. Let me ask you some questions, lost person. When it's just you and God and four walls, do you know Jesus? Can you, as I did, see yourself as this blind beggar in our text, knowing that the Savior is passing by once again? This was the last time Jesus would go through Jericho because if you study Luke and you study the other Gospels, he had resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Now, I don't know if this is the last time the Holy Spirit will call you. I don't know that. I believe every time the Word of God is preached, I believe every time we witness, God is calling people to themselves and they have to make a responsible decision to trust Him. And so, lost person, will you answer the questions today? For to not answer is to answer. You're going to make a decision today one way or the other. From the music, from the prayer, from the preaching of the word, you are lovingly being confronted with your need of the Savior. And God wants to save you. And all the saved people said, God loves every person. God wants you to repent of your sin. Why? Because the first message of the Lord Jesus Christ was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And as the Apostle Paul, I call you to receive the gift of eternal life. And you know what's so beautiful about the gift of eternal life? When God gives it, He never takes it back. Why? It's eternal. And let me tell you something. When you receive eternal life, guess what? You will never want to give it back. And all the saved folks said... Amen. Because the God who saves by His grace keeps us by His grace and He keeps us sealed until the day of redemption that when we receive that glorified body, when we never sin again, we can say hallelujah to the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. So today respond to Jesus Christ as that blind beggar did. So not only do we first what? We see the desperation of the blind man. Then what? Somebody tell me. We request. And then thirdly, I want you to feel the insistence of the beggar. The insistence of the blind man in verse 38. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. He calls out, he calls him the Son of David. This word, Messiah, and Son of David are, are synonyms. They mean the same thing. So he recognizes Jesus as king. He recognizes him as Messiah. He wants mercy. Hey, over here in this section, do y'all thank God for mercy? Amen. You thank God for mercy? Y'all thank God for mercy over here? I don't know what to call this. Maybe we'll just call this one, two, three, and four. I'm just glad to see all the Auburn and Alabama fans are sitting together because... <laughs> Y'all can help us heal up a little bit. Can anybody say amen? Are you thank God for mercy? Amen. amen. Y'all thank God for mercy? You know what mercy is? Mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. You know what I deserve? I deserve to be in hell. That's where I deserve to be. But God loved us. And so Bartimaeus, this blind beggar, he realizes this could be his last hope of ever having sight. He is absolutely desperate for Jesus to help him. Does he know Jesus is headed for the cross? Probably not. All he knows is that without his sight, he cannot be the person that he needs to be. And so what happens? He cries out. Then he cries out all the more. In other words, over and over and over again, he's crying out louder and louder and louder with each request. Son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And then what happens? And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. See, I knew Baptists were here before 1645 or whatever. They're right there in verse 39. Can anybody say amen? Oh, I found something right here. <laughs> sternly tell him to be quiet. Don't bother Jesus. He's got stuff to do. Don't bother the Lord. He's got stuff to do. Don't bother him. He's got stuff to do. Folks, I long for the day. I long for the day when the gospel is preached. When the gospel is preached and somebody stands up in the middle of the sermon and says, I want to get saved. Folks, let me tell you something. The sermon is over at that point because that is the priority to see people born again. Amen? We don't need to tell people to stop calling out to Jesus. You know, a lot of times we're our own worst enemy in the church, are we not? Amen? I think sometimes if we just love the people, tell them the truth, that God loves them, that he cares about them, I think the Holy Spirit, in fact, I know, he'll just take over the whole situation, and I think we'd see a lot more people saved if we would give more voice to the gospel and less voice to complaining. Amen? Amen? So what happens? What happens? Jesus comes to him. Look what it says. Verse 40. Say, Brother Scott, you're getting ahead of yourself. Go ahead, tell me. You're getting ahead of yourself. So let me back up. Did y'all study about Andrew today? Did y'all like that Sunday school lesson? I don't know. I was not in Sunday school. You need to be in Sunday school. And all the Sunday school teachers said... Amen. You need to be in Sunday school. What about Andrew? Y'all talked, they, they asked a question about benefits of following Jesus Christ. I didn't look over the lesson particularly. I just looked at the five questions. Here's some benefits. Your sins are forgiven. You get a new heart. You get a new life. You get your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. I think y'all represented that in Judgment House by ringing the bell. I like that idea. You don't have to worry about going to hell. You have peace in your heart. You have confidence that God who saved you by his grace will keep you by his grace until the final day of glorification. I want to talk to the youth just a minute. Y'all all right with me coming off the platform? Good, because I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> don't you dare. Don't you dare give in to the peer pressure of the world. Don't you dare give in to the peer pressure of the world. And if you're not saved, you need to do it today. You need to pray and receive the Lord today. Don't you? In fact, you know what? You know what? You be the peer pressure. All right, we got some amens over here. You be the peer pressure. You know what amen means? You know what amen means, Brother Johnny? I'm amen in myself. That don't mean I'm not amen in somebody over there. Hey, you, you better listen to that preacher. Amen. Amen's for me. 
You be the peer pressure. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Greater is he, the Holy Spirit, who lives in the believer than the devil who is in the world. Amen? Amen? You be the peer pressure. Let me find some more young ones. There's one right there. You be the peer pressure. Let me find somebody else, somebody young. You be the peer pressure. Amen? Hey, all right. Let me find another one. You be the peer pressure. You be the peer pressure. Let me find another one. Brother Ronald, you be the peer pressure. <laughs> you be the peer pressure. Great job on the guitar, by the way. You be the peer pressure. You be the peer pressure. I'm, I'm probably going to forget somebody, but I don't want to forget everybody. You be the peer pressure. Amen? Y'all believe that? Amen. Then pray for them. Get involved in the youth ministry. Get involved in the college ministry. Get involved with them. Amen? I've known some folks that have been 75, 80 years old who are a greater blessing to the young people than any youth minister. No offense, I was a youth minister at one time than a youth minister could ever be. You know why? They know stuff. Now, I know that's deep and theological, but they know stuff. I mean, I'm 50. I like to visit with folks that are 65, 75, and 85 because they're not old, they're wise. And all the wise people said, amen. All the wise people said, amen. And so I'm sitting there in the fellowship hall. The youth minister puts on a movie, The Cross and the Switchblade. I don't know if you know that story about David Wilkerson, that young Assembly of God preacher that went over to the, from Pennsylvania countryside into New York City. And i got to make this short. But I began watching that movie about Nicky Cruz. And Nicky Cruz got saved. He'd murdered 17 people. He'd lived a wild gang-style life in New York City. And we watched that movie, and all I knew on that night, February 4th, 1983, and I don't know if it was the Holy Spirit telling me this. I don't know if it was me telling myself. I said, if God can save Nicky Cruz, he can save me. And when Scott gave that invitation, wow, boy, people, people need to do this. We need to give invitations after we uh, show Christian movies, in fact, if the gospel's preached, amen. And I walked up to my youth minister, and I said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. I've been battling this for over two to three to four months, but I'm not leaving this building until I am right with God. And I don't remember praying all the prayer. I don't remember the whole words, but I remember this very distinctly. Jesus, I am not asking you to save me from hell. I'm asking you to save me from my sin. And I didn't know a lot about the Bible. I didn't know a lot about theology. I didn't know a lot about anything when it came to God. All I knew is when I went down on my knees, I was lost and going to hell. And when I got up, I was saved and going to heaven. I didn't know what had got a hold of me. I learned later that somebody, someone had got a hold of me, and that was the Holy Spirit of God. Peace came into my heart, and I knew that I was saved. That can happen to anybody. I was the blind beggar. I was the one in need of Jesus. And I've been saved now for 34 years, and I said yesterday, and when I share my testimony, I always say this, I ain't got over it yet. In fact, I want to just paraphrase Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher, and I paraphrase him when he said, I am so confident in the salvation of God. I am so assured that I am in the kingdom of God. I am so assured that I am born again that I would swing out over hell hanging on to nothing but a cardstock and sing in the face of the devil, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Amen. Do you have that testimony? Amen. Go ahead and give the Lord praise in his house. Do you have that testimony? You can have that same testimony. And you can have not only the plea of the beggar, but number two, the blind now see because of a privilege. Somebody say that with me. Say that word with me. Privilege. Jesus commands in verses 40 through 41. It says, And Jesus stopped and commanded them. He commands. He brought, he brought him to Jesus. And when he had come near, he questioned him. He says, Bring the man here. Bring him here. What about Andrew? We introduce people to Jesus. You know what Jesus would say? Bring him here. Bring him here. Bring her here. What does the blind man want? What does he want? What does he ask him? Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? 
What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Some of you can identify with this testimony that after I got saved and after you got saved, all of a sudden you open this, this glorious, beautiful, eternal book that we have in our hands and all of a sudden it made sense. Amen? It made sense. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was teaching you. Folks, I want to tell you this, that God wants to do more than just save us. He wants to use us for His kingdom. He wants to use us in prayer and evangelism and discipleship and missions and fellowship. He wants people to hear the word of God. And so Jesus not only commands them to come to him, commands the man to come to him, what does he do? He calms the situation. Jesus calms the situation. What does it say in verse 42? And Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. I can remember being in that junior physical education class in that locker room. And a guy that I'd played some ball with, baseball and football with, and had known him a long time. He, he decided he was going to be a devil worshiper. He was going to worship Satan. And so I didn't know about wh what to do. All I knew is that God loves people. Jesus died on the cross for them. He wants to save them and give them a new life. And I was just supposed to tell people about it. That's all I knew. Sounds like the plan, amen? That's all I knew. And so Bubba's down there. We're getting changed out of our, our, our gym clothes and getting ready to go to fourth period. And this guy's sitting there. He's proclaimed Satanist, got the pentagram T-shirt on. You know, just, I think he was kind of play acting or whatever, but whatever, he needed the Lord. So I just handed him a track about Jesus. Steps to knowing God. You remember that one? The four spiritual laws. You remember that one? The four spiritual laws. I gave it to him. He tore out about two or three page, pages, stuck it in his mouth, chewed it up. Spit it out on the floor, on that concrete floor, between those blue and orange lockers, right on the floor. And he looked at me and said, that's what I think about Jesus. Now, folks, I was 17 years old. I knew a little bit about the Bible by that time, but what the Holy Spirit said through me, I'll never forget because I could not have thought about it on my own. I looked at him and said, that's not what Jesus thinks about you. That's love in the face of evil. Amen? We love sinners. We don't condone the sin, but we love the sinner no matter how gross the sin is. Amen? And so Bubba's watching. What happens? What happens in the text? Jesus responds immediately to this eager request. He's wanting to give the gift of eternal life. He wants to heal the guy. I mean, you can read it. I believe in the King James it says, your faith has saved you. Your faith has made you well. I believe the man got saved. That's what I believe. I believe he had so much faith in Jesus that God saved him. Jesus saved him right there. Is that a pretty good interpretation And in all of God's people said? Here and elsewhere, Jesus praises people who exercise faith given to them. Now notice, literally, literally from the, Greek, from the Greek language, it says your faith has saved you. He saved you. Are you glad you're saved this morning? You said, how many times are you going to ask us that? I don't know, maybe 10, 20, 40, 50,000. Renee and I don't ever want to move again. We don't ever want to move again until it's time to go to heaven. Amen. We, we just, we, we 50 and 51, you know. Somebody told her yesterday she looked like she was 35. I say 25 and all of God's husband said, amen. All the husband said, yes, sir, that's a smart man. That's a wise man right there. Amen. And then Jesus commends. And immediately, immediately, he regained his sight and began following him, Jesus, glorifying God. When all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. Immediately, the man receives his sight, and the people start praising God. I, I was wondering what was going to happen when the young lady got baptized. I said, Lord, please let this church be a clapping church after somebody gets baptized. Because if they're not, I'm going to have to teach them how. Amen? They began praising God. Why? A miracle had been done. 
Jesus, knowing he's going to be betrayed, knowing he's going to be tried, knowing he's going to be whipped, knowing he's going to be crucified, he's still saving people going on his way. Amen? What about you today? Do you know Jesus? Are you saved? If you're not, do you want to be? You can. Hey, Christian, do you ever get discouraged when you're witnessing to people? Man, I witness, I witness, I witness. I try to live right. I try to do the right thing. I try to live holy before God. I try to live righteous before God. I try to tell people about Jesus, but pastor, it just never seems to happen. Don't you ever forget that the seeds of the gospel that you plant, those are for God to grow. We can't save anybody. We tell the truth of the gospel. The Holy Spirit does the convicting. He does the saving. A few months later after that reunion, I received an email from Bubba. I printed it out. I have it in my sermon outline. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. He said, Dear Scott, I got your information from the reunion book yesterday. I remember back in the 10th or 11th grade at Southwood when you would witness to me in class about Jesus. Although many years passed, eventually that seed you planted along with the prayers of other loved ones led to my salvation a few years ago. This year I was asked to become the youth director at my church, Oakmont Church of God. I lead a group of about 20 active teens on Wednesday nights and Sunday school. I have referred to my memories of your courage and dedication to Christ while you were in my class in school. I use your witness to encourage teens to have the same courage and dedication in their schools. I am happy to see that you are a pastor. Thank you again for speaking to me over 20 years ago. You made a difference in my life. Bubba, you never know who's watching. 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 watching. Let me encourage you, Christian. Peter had a little complaint of the Lord. Lord, we've left everything for you. And Peter said, I tell you the truth. No one who after leaving their mama, their daddy, their family, their jobs and follow me, they will be rewarded for what they have done. So however you vote today, that's between you and the Lord. But let me encourage you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Don't ever give up following Jesus because you never know how he's going to work in your life to help the blind now see. Amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. This time I'm going to ask Brother Johnny and Miss Vicky to come for a time of invitation. I'm going to ask Brother Scott to come, help during the invitation. Listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that, that ask you to raise your hand, look up at me or anything like that. But if you want the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what's about to happen. You may have never been in church before. This is what's going to happen. In just a moment, we're going to stand as a congregation. The music's going to begin to play. They're going to start singing uh, a song. And if you want to know the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, every person Jesus called, he called publicly. And if Jesus can hang on a cross for six hours asking us to walk in front of people who love us, about 40 or 50 or 60 feet is not asking a lot. Why? Because Jesus has done everything that needs to be done for us to be saved. So if you're not saved, listen, nobody's going to ask you to give any money and they're going to ask you to quote any scripture or make a speech or anything like that. Scott and I are here to help you understand what it means to know Jesus. How about you, Christian? God put somebody on your heart during this service. You can come to this altar and pray for the lost. I long for the day when churches again pray for lost people, and seek the Lord about those who need to be saved. You may just need to come by yourself and pray. You may be hurting and you need to come to the altar and pray. I have a standard. Gentlemen pray with gentlemen. Ladies pray with ladies. That's the standard. And if God lays on your heart to come pray with somebody, you do that. You do exactly what God has laid on your heart. Father, this is your invitation. And God, we commit it unto you. And God, we ask that you do among us what seems good to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. If you would at this time, please stand for the invitation. Brother Scott and I are here. My microphone is off. We have a Bible in our hand and Christ in our heart. You come.